open up. And I'm going to get started recording right now. So hi, everyone. My name is Evo Haining. It's a pleasure to meet you. As I've mentioned, my uh, work primarily is leading the design lab at RealityCraft. I am a strategic consultant and producer. I have been a producer for 25 years in generative, interactive, and immersive media, and I help both technology and media companies figure out these gaps. And so that can include ethical challenges in how to deploy AI and XR tools in your existing workflows, or creating a new production, creating a new type of experience and where you might want to include participatory media, interactive media, or some sort of creative design element. So I'm here to work with you today to help you build your own toolkit. And we're going to explore these topics. Number one, how to choose your tools. What are the types of generative media tools that you might be using or looking for? Uh, number two, case studies in media production and publishing. We're going to explore a handful of ways in which uh, myself and others are using these tools effectively in publishing work. But we're also going to talk about the times in which we might not want to use generative media. Then we're going to talk about how and where to get started with these tools. Um, that's going to include some ways in which you can navigate the field and search, not just go by hype. We're going to talk about PromptCraft and the book that I wrote a little bit, but also inquiry and how you ask these questions with you, your creative team or with your workplace. And then we're going to talk about next steps, and that includes questions around ethics and safety and policy and law, all of the things that are coming down the pike. So it's a pleasure to meet you all. Again, my name is Evo Haining. I've been a producer for 25 years. I've been using AI tools in my media production work since working with the State Department and the White House on campaigns such as the launch of the Affordable Care Act. When we had to launch that production, I was trying to figure out how to bring together millions of social media posts in a way that I could curate, bubble up, analyze by sentiment, and then figure out what to put forward quickly into a real-time six-hour live broadcast on YouTube. So I began searching for existing plugins and APIs and also recognizing where existing APIs were stopping. Now, this was 12 years ago, so a lot of this field has changed over the years. And so we're going to talk about how to build your toolkit today and some of the considerations you might want to be making. For example, do you own your data? Do you own your own AI? So these are the topics and the terms that I want you to be familiar with. If you've heard about LLMs, uh, you might have heard of ChatGPT from OpenAI or Claude from Anthropic. You might have heard of other tools from uh, Microsoft and Google and also some smaller tools as well that are, we'll talk about a little bit later. LLM means large language model. Now, some of these large language models have advanced capacities to do things that might include other functions. They might be able to operate as an automated assistant in your work. Now, when we program those assistants to do very specific functions, let's say in our databases or helping us to manage archives, curation, those are AI agents and specifically AI agents that are programmed to do something very specific with our information. Or for example, if you're creating a GPT, um, these are characters in part. Now, do not anthropomorphize an AI agent. This is not a human, this is not a character per se, but AI agents are capable programmed assistants. You can think of them more like an assistant that you have hired and trained to do a very specific job in your system. Next, let's talk through GenVid, generative video tools. Now there's a lot of these out there. They're quite fun. Um, I personally love exploring these, but they're also a little bit weird, right? You get six fingers and all of those sorts of things. And there's a lot of these tools coming. Generative images, 3D assets, skyboxes, scanning and world building apps. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, open source and open initiatives all the way throughout. Now there are open source AI solutions that are not open source. There are companies like OpenAI 
that are not open source. That is a product. It may have started as an open source research endeavor many years ago, but the current iteration is not an open source product. There may be open source tools that come from these companies, but it's important to distinguish if you're dealing with something that is truly open source, maybe you've found it on GitHub or Hugging Face versus something that you can only access in the cloud. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about um, not just own your own AI, but downloading and running it on your own machines. But this is not exactly that workshop. So we're going to just start at that space. And I want you to go. And if that's something interesting to you, we will explore that in future workshops as well. So this entire field is a bit of a minefield, right? If you are someone who cares about creativity and art, but you're also struggling with the uh, the rubs of ethical design. Now, those rubs are extremely challenging to overcome. It is very difficult to figure out, for example, what are we going to do when it comes to being able to make a good decision for the public? Um, are they going to be upset with the ways in which we are using these tools? Um, are they feeling like we are taking something away from them or we have not requested the right consent, right? Every media interaction is a relationship and trust is a part of that conversation. So every time you're using any AI tool or generative media tool, you need to be thinking about is this improving or damaging the trust I have with my audience? Because if it is adding to the creativity and the flow and the wonder and the joy, that's great. And if it's taking away from the creative experience, you need to reassess whether you are using the tool at the right time or maybe should step back from the entire use case in this regard. So not every tool is going to be right for every team. Obviously, if you're in the public sector, you may not find that these tools are right for you or you might find that they're only right in certain settings. Let's say you're going to have a conversation in a court. You need to create a recreation or a simulation those sorts of things might be appropriate or ethical uses. Same with documentarians trying to tell a story appropriately, figuring out how to attribute and make sure that people understand that something is generated. Now, in my book, Promcraft, I talk a little bit more about how to deal with attribution, but in the next edition, we are going to go far deeper in these conversations. So feel free to reach out. I do run a a community, both on Facebook and in other places called Reality Craft. You are welcome there. And this book will be updated. I am currently writing the second edition now. Um, when you're thinking about publishing something like this, this book in the first version was done in Canva, um, which was extremely challenging as a publishing initiative. However, Canva has gotten a lot better. And Canva integrates a lot of these generative media tools in a single uh, interface that you can work with, that you can publish from. So if you're thinking about how are you going to go from experiment to publishing in a way that you can be relatively transparent about the uses and how you've built it, this is one method. Using Canva or, for example, Adobe Creative Suite can also get you there. Now, as a filmmaker, I am participating currently in the Culver Cup. There are uh, 50 filmmakers around the world who are participating in this, uh, uh, let's call it a challenge of sorts. Um, we are all making shorts. So I'm going to take you through some of the conversations I'm having with myself as I go through the storytelling process, because it, as a storyteller, as a producer, I want to use these tools effectively but only at the right times. I want to tell the stories that can't be told well in other means. And so I'm constantly pushing the envelope and figuring out if a tool is the right tool for the right job. Now, this is an experiment that I've been doing um, using some of my sort of more uh, dreamy modern art. Now, I find that some of these experiments do break down. This is in Luma Dream Machine. And we're going to look at Luma Dream Machine in a moment, but the thing I want you to know about Luma Dream Machine is it has a cool little extend button. So I can generate five seconds at a time, and then I can say, okay, I like where this is going. Let's take it in this direction now, that direction. And that is absolutely fascinating if you're thinking about trying to bring together a story in which the um, 
the momentum needs to take some big moves, right? So this one, for example, I'm working on a new series called Grow a Home. And this is an immersive series where I plan to use biogenic and natural building materials to grow homes from seed all the way through the building process. Now, that is something that's going to take a number of years to grow. So how do we prototype this? Well, that's where these tools are useful. Unfortunately, these are also tools that are useful for deep fakes and other types of considerations. And so you need to think about whether if you're trying to create meme craft, if you're trying to create something that is a short viral piece, it might be appropriate to play with these dynamics. It also might not be appropriate depending on your audience and whether they can tell the difference between real news and something that is a deep fake. I would encourage you to let people know you always need to manage your AI attributions properly, whether you're going to social media or otherwise, please let people know if you're creating generative content, because as you'll see in law um, in California and other places, it is now required. You need to let people know if something is generated or simulated. So for example, these are clips that I've made using Luma, but I started those in another tool that we're going to look at in a moment. So let me pull out of this uh, stop share for a moment. And I want to show you some of the tools that I use behind the scenes. So we've talked a little bit about Luma Dream Machine. So we're going to go over there to start. And Luma Dream Machine is, is a beauty. Now, she uh, has some special capacities, as you can tell. Um, but she's also just, uh, she, she has a dreamy quality, if that makes any sense at all. Um, so what we're going to do is I want to go back and I want to show you some of the things that I've created here and what those look like, right? Because there's a lot of different ways those can play out. Now you can see as a filmmaker, I'm testing different ideas. Maybe not every idea works. So if I click on this little guy here, you can see that motion doesn't work right because... If you're thinking about generative media, they are all built on models. And so they need enough footage, for example, in this case of how uh, a cockroach would walk. If it doesn't have that information in its model, it's just draggling parts instead of using its legs to walk appropriately. So this is where sometimes our tools are not quite right for the job yet. They're not trained appropriately, or they're gonna create something that feels like, you know, kind of nightmare fuel. And, and you might be going for that as a style that's obviously like one of the main styles that people go for in generative media. Um, you know, these sort of surrealistic themes are super popular. But you can see here, I've got, you know, a mix of things that are more uh, sort of naturalist. And I've also got this sort of psychedelic look that are happening in the same shot. Now that's where using that extend button here. So I'm doing a prompt craft uh, in my first handle, and you can also add an image and make that happen. So some of these I do based on existing art, and that can be a really lovely way to think about bringing art to life. It can also be a little creepy depending on what you're trying to go for. So if you're thinking about tools in the generative video space, I will say there are a handful of really great tools out there right now. I use Runway sometimes if I need to make um, motion graphics that include moving titles. Um, so something that could be like an intro feed. Um, you can see some of these more dreamy things. Sometimes I really enjoy doing here. Um, because I find that these are beautiful and abstract and unique. Now, this is less likely to also be a problem in terms of stepping on other people's IP. And this is something I really want you thinking about no matter what types of tools you're working with. Now, very quickly, because we have about eight minutes, 10 minutes max in this lightning talk left. I just want to talk you through the kinds of future tools that you might want to be looking for. Now, um, this is from Matt. Matt has a really great YouTube channel, and I'm going to encourage you to go through Matt's picks and kind of check out what he's doing here. But it is sort of like taking all of those product hunt pages. And if you need anything in, whether it's just inspiration or prompt guides, music and audio, 
any type of media, you can find it here. And you can also find things that are free or on GitHub or open source. So depending on your specific needs and use cases, I want you thinking about um, is this the right tool for the right job? Is it giving me the results I'm looking for? Or are the cockroach legs not working? Um, maybe you need something like Ideogram here. Ideogram is what I use when I need very realistic uh, titles and anything that uses text. Now, there's a handful of image generators that can do text. Um, the Journey, for example, in version 6 does text just fine. But Ideogram is, number one, relatively free and affordable. It's very useful, but it's also um, relatively easy for those of us who do need to do things with text all the time. Let's say you're trying to create slides and that sort of thing. So you can see here, this is how I created the, the various slides for today in our title slide. And here's what that prompt looks like, right? It's very simple. I just wanted to give it enough information to tell it what kind of illustration style I was looking for and what the text would be, right? So. I've tried a lot of different styles. I've done things for my band and music projects. I've done things for television and concept design. I do things for talks, including talks with governments. And so I wanted you to be able to see how these tools end up, uh, you know, creating one slide in a deck. They're not creating the whole story. The story is still up to you, along with how you choose to use these tools. Now, We've talked a little bit about open source and I wanted to talk you through Hugging Face very quickly. Now, Hugging Face is a great place to start if you are looking to experiment, if you want to try things that are still coming out, if you're into open source, if you're into uh, trying things and giving feedback, you maybe want to be you know, going between the GitHub page and you also want to experiment. So. Uh, Flux is one of the ways in which we do image generation. If you are not into mid journey, you don't want to be on ideogram. Flux is giving many wonderful results. And there are lots of different versions of Flux here on Hugging Face. So Hugging Face is divided up into models, data sets, spaces, and then there's some documentation and different types of things that you can access. So you're going to find different types of Flux here, Flux being a uh, relatively open way to generate images. And you might find that there are specific versions of Flux that help you create uh, realism, for example, or certain types of animation or that work faster. Uh, there are also versions of open GPT, right? So these are things that might be uh, using existing open data sets like Llama on uh, Meta's tools, um, and maybe you're doing things that are mashups of multiple APIs. So I would encourage you to go check out Hugging Space on your own time. You're going to find lots of cool models. And if you're trying to find a very specific model that's going to work for you, um, that might be, you know, for example, 3D art or avatar art or something very specific. Now, I use GitHub quite a bit. Um, I've been on GitHub for many years, like many of you who go between code and, and creative technology. Um, this is NVIDIA's ACE, uh, which is open and available for those who want to be creating. Uh, ACE and NIM uh, from NVIDIA allow for many types of, of generative plugins to be brought into immersive worlds. Let's say you're creating a mixed reality experience. Um, they have a platform where you can bring all of this together and publish, uh, whether that's uh, going into a game world and working with something that's going from their tools in Omniverse uh, to going towards something like a virtual production set or Unreal Engine. So you can see what those avatars look like and sort of the, the ways in which open source code is much more sort of technically available, but not necessarily creatively available for most people who don't consider themselves coders day to day. If you're a creator and you're just trying to get started and figure out where to get going, one of the places I encourage people to try first is called Skybox at Blockade Labs. Now, Blockade Labs has been around for a bit, and they started with these beautiful skyboxes. They are building other products that will let people build entire worlds, but you can see that you can either create what we call a skybox, which is a whole 360 immersive experience zone. And you can create that from just a prompt. 
And then you can go and, you know, decide the art style, maybe the palette. You might need to go and modify certain types of things. So you can start with an existing model or you can prompt one from scratch. You can remix, you can edit, and they also have some 3D asset generation coming. So being able to build entire immersive worlds and mixed reality experiences and then publishing them. Uh, you might want to try Skybox, give it a few worlds, see what you can do with it. And you might want to be uh, paying for a handful of these kinds of tools if you are a creator who's doing that level of work. Now, you're going to notice here that many of these give you different types of render styles, cinematic realism, drone shot, very cool, um, UHD render, it's going to look really poppy and vibrant and gorgeous. So think about the kinds of storytelling you're doing and whether the tool is going to match the output you are looking for, not just the aspect ratio or the resolution, but your color landscape, your style of realism or illustration or art, um, not every tool is going to be able to capture that. And you're going to want to experiment with some of your own art and ideas before you get too invested in a workflow. So that's why most of these tools will give you a few free uh, generations and you're going to want to test it out with something fairly complex. If you've got a project in mind, Pick out some of the hardest things to do, like the cockroach walking, and think about, okay, can I test this easily, right? So here I knew I needed some sound effects of a cockroach walking. And here it gave me four different generations. And those sound effects may or may not work for me. They're kind of crunchy. They're soft. And maybe they're too soft for me. Maybe I need to amplify it or try something else. This is 11labs.com and 11labs offers lots of different tools. You have text-to-speech, speech-to-speech. So that's microphone and being able to train things, including training on your own voice. You can do uh, multilingual dubbing and you can do some things around voice cloning as well, which is pretty fascinating. I've used this uh, for music as well as other types of storytelling. So um, these are really interesting tools that you can explore in your own time. Eleven Labs is considered a professional product. Um, I do want you to be super honest with yourself and with others before using any of these tools because all of the rules of publishing still matter. That includes consent and rights management and whether you have the permissions to use something. So um, use your materials. This is, I'm going to show you something behind the hood now in my pre-production workflow very quickly before we wrap. Um, this is something that I just wanted to show you and how I'm using Notion. Now, Notion is an organizational tool. It allows for teams to work together and to maybe set out different milestones and, and to-do lists and keep everything organized. So you can see I've got a production here. I'm keeping my different sort of sections in the production book organized. And each of these is going to have a different uh, element of the production that I am going to be in conversation with my team around. So this is a document that I can share with friends. I can pull out the treatment and we can go through it and say, okay, I like this. I don't like that. That's too long. Let's use this image instead. So using these kinds of places, uh, some folks obviously like to use the, the Google suite or Adobe suite of, of um, curatorial tools and asset management tools. Um, Notion, I find because of the AI integration, is a very easy way to collaborate and be able to get some things done together. So we're going to be wrapping up very shortly, and I'm just going to let you know about a couple of things that are coming up. And these are opportunities for you to join me for a deeper dive. So let's say you want to go deeper into those scanning and world building apps or the own your own side creating from your own art and ideas. I'm going to be offering a lightning talk next month with Avi. Avi Barzev is my uh, the president to my VP at XR Guild. So Avi founded the XR Guild at xrguild.org. Uh, during the pandemic, I am a member of the board with many amazing leaders in our mixed reality and immersive spatial communities. We're going to be talking about ethical design inquiry and specifically the questions you need to be asking about safety and security, risk management, appropriateness, and all of these conversations. 
This is a deep dive conversation, but it will be a 30 minute lightning talk like this one today. And if you're interested in going deeper onto the concept design train, this will be offered in November and intro to Gen AI, which is a quick start. So I do these very quick start conversations and I also do offer these for free as well as on my YouTube. You can find those at realitycraft.art. So if you're interested in exploring any of these topics or you'd like to bring me in to do this as a workshop for you, I'm happy to come and work with you. Again, my name is Evo Haining. It has been my pleasure to give you a little bit of an insight into how I currently I'm thinking about generative media tools and what's going to be working for me when I think about producing with all of you. So if I can support you in any way, whether it's nailing down the language of prompt craft or thinking strategically about what tool makes sense for your problem or your storytelling challenge, I'm happy to collaborate with you. I am wrapping a short in about two weeks and then I'm happy to jump on your team. So let's have a conversation about your creative technology projects and the kinds of stories that matter to you. So, um, this is one part of my work. I also help you build worlds. I have an art and antiques business and you're welcome to stop by. I'm in the East Bay in California or I'm absolutely welcome and happy to come to you. Uh, we do have a very large collection of art objects and antiques. So if you're trying to create an immersive reality experience that includes both physical objects as well as sculpted, generated, immersive and spatial objects, I can work with you from both ends of the problem. So I'm happy to connect with you. Again, my name is Evo Haining. I hope that you will feel free to reach out and uh, let me know where I can support you in this work. And please, if there is any way that you need to get some help, maybe answering these kinds of questions for yourself or just thinking about how to answer these questions for your C-suite, I meet with governments all over the world and I'm happy to help this with you. So please feel free to reach out again. My name is Evo Haining. Have a great day.